You've heard about seagrass already from the Google Review and its value. Um, and here from Dr. Laura Howell, who's the Green Officer at Mental Health Institute since 2015. Laura studied marine, bio uh, marine biology at the University, based at the Marine Lab in Port Heron. She did a PhD there in marine habitat and species and pattern recovery. She's a diver, active in the local sea search group, and a member of um, something unpronounceable like the Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology, is that right? She's, not <laughs> not <laughs> that um, she's also a chartered scientist, a chartered marine scientist. Um, today she's going to share her research into seagrass conservation. Thanks, Joan. It's not my research, it's Max Wilder after us speak, so we all think I'm absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it, just for those of you who might not know who Manx Wildlife Trust are, we're the leading um, nature conservation charity on the island and it's our 50th year this year, so um, birthday to us. Um, obviously we don't just do marine, we do the terrestrial side of things as well. Um, so we've got 28 um, nature reserves now, um, which is about 500 hectares, 500 acres I should say now. So um, a little bit of context, obviously some of you will have sat in on the, um, the balloon carbon teams talk earlier today, so you might already know a little bit about this. So the only um, species of seagrass we have in Manx waters is Zostra marina. Um, and you can see from, it, you can just about see the point of where the locations are. So we've got five main areas. And they vary in size from really sort of small patches um, to quite large areas up in Ramsey Bay. And what's interesting about them is that they're all very different in the sense that the exposure is slightly different, the substrate, so the, the seabed that they settle on is different. Ramsey's very sandy, whereas um, Fort Island Gully is much more sort of gravelly and mixed sediments. So they're found in different areas, and then you'll have really discrete areas where you've got very defined boundaries, and then some of the other ones just get really patchy, so they're all very different, um, so I find that quite interesting. They're all within the MNRs except for Baldwin Bay, um, unfortunately, so that's something that we need to take into consideration for future um, protection going forwards. Um, so they started back in 2015. Um, when we started to um, look at our seagrass meadows in a little bit more detail, and it started with collecting samples um, for um, a UK project, and the, the report there um, is from 2016 from Jones and Cunnersworth, and it talks about the health of seagrass beds around the British Isles, and it was really nice to be part of that project. And then more recently, um, in 2019 and 2021, we've been doing some genetic analysis collecting leaves. So here you can see in the image, um, we've just taken some um, leaves and we cut them to a certain length and we dry them out and then they get sent away for genetic analysis. The thought was that we might have a discrete and isolated um, seagrass. Um, sadly, the data came back and it really, really wasn't. But what was interesting was we took it from the Fort Island gully and that is one plan, the whole lot is one plan, there was one data set and they were like, you sure you took them widely spaced? I was like, yeah, as, as the method is requested, but it's actually just one big bed. So that was really fascinating. Um, so talking a little bit about Ramsey Bay, um, so the, the coloured borders, you can just about make out here, delineate uh, Ramsey Marine Nature Reserve. Um, and it's divided into the five zones here, but the one that we're really interested down here is this little pink one here, which is the seagrass zone. Um, so this was designated in 2018, finally. Um, but through diving, um, myself included, and some of the other local divers in Ramsey, we were mentioned to DEFA that we were saying that the seagrass is expanding and that we were seeing it beyond the, the little conservation zone and that it was as far north as um, the INP. So DEFA, um, went and did some surveys. So these little dots represent um, a seagrass that was found. So this little triangle you see here is the conservation zone. And they didn't survey within it, but they went outside. And here's the iron pier here. So to give you an idea, it has massively extended beyond its range, which is really, really positive. And the red dots, obviously, are where the dense areas are. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is maybe survey off here a bit further, more towards Mackles in the future to see if there is any more and maybe do 
do some more surveys further north to see if there's any there as well. So it was really fascinating. So it just shows you, with the protection in place, how this is extended. We can't say it's entirely down to the, the, um, the conservation zone because we never really looked within that area before, but definitely is expanding, um, nevertheless, um, real benefit of, of the protection that's being afforded. Um, so then, um, in 2021, in June, we've been chatting to some, again, local divers who said, oh, there's eelgrass in, in Bulgan Bay. Um, and we were a bit like, oh, right, okay, let's go check it out. Um, so we did. So we, as divers, there were three buddy pairs, you can see us there. So each transect line represents roughly where the divers went. It's our start point and our end point. I'm sure it wasn't completely linear, our dive, but it gives you an idea of where we covered and pretty much the entire area had seagrass. The very top, it didn't start till a bit further down, but this whole area here turned out to um, have seagrass meadow, really quite a healthy seagrass meadow as well, which was really good to see. Um, and um, funding for this came from microgaming. Um, we're working more with corporates to help enable us to do research and things like that. Um, and this funding came from uh, microgaming to enable us to do these surveys. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more um, about their support as well and as we go through. So um, we, with permission from DEFA, because obviously eelgrass, I'm sure you're all aware, is a protected species. Um, with permission from DEFA to do so, we wanted to trial um, translocating eelgrass plants. So we wanted to do it in Port Erin Bay because um, Zoster had been seen there in the past. This map is date back to the 1900s. Uh, so we knew it had been found there previously. So the plan was to take eelgrass from Fort Island um, because it's a really good, healthy, strong bed, mature and very well established and transplant some plants rather than seeds into Port Erin Bay. So here you can see some examples of the divers here um, in the eelgrass. And what we were trying to do was um, take a length of rhizomes, about 10 centimetres of rhizomes with the roots. And we took something around, I think it was 200 plants that we were going to transplant. Um, and this funding, like I said, came from microgaming to help us enable this. So it covers both costs um, and fuel and things like that. So um, one of the other things that we did um, we did some core sampling at the same time. This was for the Blue Carbon team, because they're, I'm sure you've heard all about that earlier today, um, looking at carbon sequestration in sediments. So this is um, an image of the divers, terribly bad one, unfortunately, um, in the site in Port Erin. So it was, we took some core samples before we um, transplanted the seagrass, but we also took some in Fort Island Bay as well. So we basically transplanted the seagrass, um, and what we used was some little um, skewers for your kebabs, basically. We chopped them in half, tied some biodegradable string around them to create little chopsticks, and that was used to anchor the, the plants into the seabed. You can just see there a couple of the ends of the chopsticks, so it's to stop them washing away. So we planted them at 25 centimetre intervals across a grid, so we had a grid square of about 2 by 3 metres. Um, and they were all transplanted on the same day and we cut the blade lengths to the same length so that, um, to 30 centimetres so that they wouldn't be washed away too quickly until they rooted in and also it meant when we wanted to do some monitoring and measure blade lengths that we knew that they all started with the same blade lengths. So you can see here some of the blade lengths have, have started to, to grow. So we went a month afterwards and um, the, the shoot, they were shooting and they were obviously taller than the first centimetres when we first started. We thought that was really, really brilliant. So we went back for a second visit in October and you can see here we've lost a little bit. So it formed an L shape. We've lost some of our seagrass beds. And then sadly when we visited in January, all had been lost with the storms. However, we learned a huge amount about the process and the methodologies that we were doing. And it was a really, really useful exercise. Um, and we found that the methods seemed to work really well. We think we were on the, the right lines, but it was a very mobile site, um, very exposed. And we think linking with the, the breakwater, at the time that there was eelgrass, the breakwater in Port Erin was probably still intact and afforded a lot more protection 
um, than before. And the reason we didn't transplant the seagrass behind the breakwater was because the, the depth there has, has been increased. There's a lot of undercutting and scouring, and actually we found that it was too deep to plant it there. They wouldn't have, have survived um, due to the depth because they need light. So. Um, but part of the work that we did as well was to transplant into the same location. Um, and this is to just ensure that the methods are robust. So um, should the eelgrass have failed at the site, we could in Port Erin, we could say, well, it wasn't the methods, it was something else. It helps us to narrow it down. So we only plant, transplanted a few plants that you can see here. Um, the problem with this site, as I've said in one of my early slides, is it's real mixed sediment. And actually trying to bury anything in that sediment is really difficult. Think of like sort of rubble and trying to plant a plant in a, a patch of rubble. Really, really difficult for it to sort of bed in and get, get any um, hold. Um, but you can see the divers there again collecting the samples ready to transplant. And we also went back to make sure that where we're taking the core samples from that, that main bed, that there was no damage to, to the bed. And I'm very pleased to say there wasn't. We really struggled to actually find where we're taking core samples from. So, positive. Um, as a result of that, um, we've um, joined a partnership with um, KPMG to help fund some more of our work. So, helping the Blue Carbon team um, to map and gain a, a, the meadows and also to get some information about the health of the meadows and the um, biodiversity of the site, so the animals and, and other organisms that will be using the site. So we're trying to build up some greater knowledge. So KPMG have come on board to enable us to do that, to cover boat time and, and, and that kind of thing. And one of the things that we did was um, on World Eelgrass Day, or Seagrass Day, we went and did a snorkel to basically show everyone how awesome seagrass is. And um, so it was a really great day. The weather wasn't the best, as you can see, um, but we all had a really, really nice time. And that's part of the work that we do as well, is that importance of engaging with the public and raising awareness of, of the importance of seagrass and why everyone is getting very excited about it. Um, so it was a really great day. Everyone had a great time. So we're early days of our um, eelgrass mapping. Um, so what the divers have been doing, so obviously this is um, Fort Island here. Um, we've been going in and we've mapped the area within Fort Island Gully. Um, we put a little um, GPS unit on top of a little float and it follows us around and tracks where we've been. So we've found all these individual little sites here, a lot of Derby Haven, they're just very small, discreet little pockets, but that's been really um, useful. We've actually found another one somewhere over here. Um, my colleague Lee has found another site, so that's eight sites for Derby Haven, which is really nice. So the next phase, because as you can imagine, Fort Island is quite a small space, but when you want to survey Ramsey Bay, you can imagine that's quite a huge area for a diver to be able to cover. So to help sort of speed up the process a little bit, um, we have designed what we call um, as a drop-down camera here. So um, this is Alex, um, my marine intern, and there's a camera uh, going through a mountain here that looks at the quadrat. So this is the image that you'll see. Um, and this is the image when you have the camera settings wrong and you don't have the edges on. Um, so we're learning. Um, and the idea with this is that it will enable us to look at percentage cover, blade length, general health of the eelgrass, but the species that are also present within that area. Um, the one thing, obviously, if you're suddenly putting something down into the seabed, if you're a mobile species like a fish, you're probably going to be a bit panicked and, and swim away. So to help us capture other species that might use the area, um, we've created a bruv. So it's a baited remote underwater video and hopefully this will play. Um, and this is one of the bits of footage and what's coming through here is sea bass. Um, so this was in Derby Haven Bay as well. This was one of our trials. So that was really exciting. Um, to see what comes in. So basically, the bird feeder here is full of mackerel or, or tuna or whatever you want to, to put in there, some kind of fish, um, depending on what you remember to buy from the supermarket on your way down there. Um, but you can see there's little gobies swimming around, and this is up just on the edge of the eelgrass bed. You can see underneath, it's not sat on it, so there's no concerns about damaging the eelgrass. It's, it's sat next to the eelgrass bed. This was placed, in this case, by one of our divers. Um, we'd actually gone in and placed it to, to make sure it was in the right position as well. Um, but yeah, so we're going to have lots and lots of video footage to, to process over the next few months. 
Um, and this gives you a bit of an idea that the work for Brovs is also to look at the marine nature reserves um, and have some sort of <coughs> monitoring sites so we can go back there a few times. So we've got some sites, obviously, within the MNRs and some without for a comparison, but also everywhere will include areas within the EFRS zone so we can look at what's coming up and build up a picture of what's going on in terms of species that use the, the eelgrass zones and whether there might be differences between the different species that you see between the different, different areas. You know, Ramsey might attract a different, um, different subset of species compared to, say, Fort Island or garlic. So it's really interesting, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, one of the other things we wanted to do, um, this, the idea of the project is to do it year on year to, to keep building up more and more information and see if our eelgrass is expanding or contracting. But some of the sites are really, really small, like, like this one here. Um, and we wanted to understand what, what was going on, whether they're expanding or contracting. And the, um, the GPS wouldn't pick it up, it's small, it's about the size of this table. So unless it suddenly grew to the size of this room, we really struggled to pick up any changes. So we put some um, metal rods in, and this was in we put them in in February around the eelgrass zone and then we went back in August this year to have a look and you can see that it is moving um, and, and expanding in this direction here so that was really interesting to sort of see that. Um, as I said before obviously it's really important that we engage with others but it's also about learning um, so we've been really lucky this year um, to go to the seagrass nursery um, that's run by um, Project Seagrass down in Pembrokeshire. So this is me having a look at um, their cold storage where they're, they're um, um, I want to say growing seeds, but they're germinating seeds, I should say. And then this is Burn Discovery Centre over on the, the north um, east coast, sort of um, near the Humber where the team, along with the Blue Carbon team and DEFA went over to learn and see what was going on over there. So Orsted have funded seagrass restoration, intertidal seagrass restoration um, and the, so the team went to sort of see what that was all about which was really really interesting. So um, the hope for our future plans is basically to continue mapping like we have done for Ireland and Derby Haven but to do it on all sites and to monitor the health and, and, and sort of create that baseline to help support the work that the Carmen team are doing. Um, and then based on that we can decide do we want to trial grow some more, um, do another trial somewhere, whether that's seeds or plants. Do, do we need to? Do we need to expand our seagrass meadows? That's to be decided, but that could be a possible possible option. And do we want to set up a nursery, maybe, depending on the amount that we want to generate? Maybe we, maybe we do, maybe we don't, who knows? Um, I definitely think we're, we're not going to be planting 3 million hectares or anything huge like that, but there's the possibility to expand some areas. So maybe that's something for the future. Um, but yeah, we'll get the mapping and the baseline data done first and we'll see where we go from there. Um, but just yeah, a massive thank you to a lot of our partners who have been involved in all the work that we've done because um, we wouldn't be able to do it without you all. So, thanks.
knowledge of what peatland is, but I'm not sure about everyone. Um, looking at um, blanket bog and lowland peat, um, how we go about surveying the depth of peat, um, how does peat become degraded, um, how do we survey and map the condition of the peat, and restoring peatland on the benefits of restoration as well. So, um, blanket bog is a type of habitat that kind of forms a big blanket over, over the hills quite often. Um, one of its main components is sphagnum moss, which is this, well, this is one type of, or possibly two, of um, sphagnum moss that we get in the uplands. Um, it's amazing moss. Um, it forms in hummocks um, and it can hold like 20 times or more its weight in water, so it actually raises its own water table. Um, creating waterlogged conditions um, and also really acidic conditions as well and it's those conditions that um, really inhibit decomposition so um, all the, the sphagnum plants keep growing and the, the bits that are dead at the bottom don't quite decompose properly so um, they form into a nice carbon rich peat which is the really thick black stuff you get on the hills which is nice um, so mosses, um, sphagnum mosses and other, other vegetation you get in blanket bogs um, are really good at sequestering carbon. Um, and not only do they sequester it, they then store it really long term in the peat. So peat can develop um, over thousands and thousands of years. Um, it's probably been developing on the island for at least sort of five to six thousand years. Um, and elsewhere for longer as well. So it's a really good long term storage if it's in good condition. Um, you also get um, lowland peat as well. We've got some areas on the island that are particularly um, good for deep lowland peat, such as the Currents area and the Loch Cranstall. Um, and that forms in a slightly different way in that you have um, a basin that is very waterlogged and that stops the decomposition of plants. So you don't always need sphagnum there. This um, slide is actually a picture of Loch Cranstall, and there wasn't much sphagnum at this particular point, yet yeah, there was several metres of peat. Um, and so it's, it's quite often deeper peat in lowland um, areas as well. Um, so, um, we were talking about the, the survey that we started quite a few years ago now. Um, we realised that we know where some of the peat is on the island, and Philip um, Riddle obviously over here has done quite a lot of um, surveys around certain areas of peat where it's deep, but we didn't know what the total coverage um, of, of peat was on the uplands. Um, and, and it's really kind of important to know in terms of future decision making for land use. Um, so we started on a, um, a very time consuming um, surveying of up to about 10,000 hectares of upland peat. Um, it hasn't been finished, we've probably done about 5,500 hectares. Um, covered some core areas, still some to do. Um, but yeah, it's very time consuming. We're doing it on a, a, a grid of approximately 150 metres. So it's, yeah, there's lots of survey points. Um, and it's basically using these depth rods here, um, pushing them into the ground as far as they can go. And when you hit kind of mineral soil, it will stop being able to flush, and you can kind of measure the depth then. So that's how it works. So I've got some students there that came over the last summer from Swansea Uni, um, and they helped with some survey work. And they've been very happy with that. <laughs> so if anyone wants to help, it's fun. Um, We've also got um, our, reserve, our reserves officer and went to my back coach, Trisha, um, surveying the depth of what comes on. We, we kind of got the rods stuck in a few places almost because it, <laughs> they went right down to the handle and it was hard to get them out, but there was a good three metres in places, so that was good. Um, so as I said, it's, um, it's kind of important to know where our peat is for future land management, whether that's um, how you graze the uplands or um, any other projects that might be um, there, we just kind of need to know what's what's around <coughs> and to inform any restoration work as well, where, where the key areas would be. Um, the Climate Change Act um, did provide for um, a peatland register as well, so that's one of the projects we're looking at, um, is to create a register of all peatlands, both upland and lowland. Um, in order to protect them. So the idea would be that the area would be registered, um, landowners would then receive a code of conduct to try and help them to maintain people in good condition um, and protect it in that way. So that's, that's an ongoing piece of work that hopefully will give protection to areas that wouldn't have previously been protected. Um, so a lot of our peat unfortunately is in a degraded condition. So um, there's many reasons for this. Um, historically, a lot of the peat, especially in the uplands, was 
I call it Lillens as well, uh, um, was drained. Um, some of it was, I think, um, sort of a work creation scheme for those who are working summer months in tourism, something for them to do in the winter, but it was all, the aim was to improve um, grazing on the uplands by drying it out, creating more sort of grassland habitat rather than bog. Um, so there's lots of drains over the uplands. Um, also peat cutting, so this is probably what's going on here. Um, it's known as turbering, um, and people were encouraged until reasonably, reasonably recently to go and cut peat for fuel. Um, it has now been banned under the um, Climate Change Act, but it's, um, yeah, until recently that they were cut, and obviously leaves these steep faces of um, exposed peat, um, which are then susceptible to erosion, drying out, um, which obviously then leads to further erosion. And they tend not to get new vegetated, occasionally they do, but um, sheep like them, they like to shelter in them and rub up and have a scratch against them, so that prevents them from getting new vegetated as well. Um, some areas, um, overgrazing can be a problem. Um, the sphagnum forms nice hummocks, and if the sheep are trampling all over it, it can just prevent them from growing properly. Um, and the sheep do also tend to eat the other um, vegetation, bog habitat vegetation, such as your, um, your heathers, your bilberries, cobras, things like that. Um, and it eventually leads to a sort of vast dominated habitat, um, which is not peat forming. Um, it kind of looks like that. <laughs> um, recreation can cause sort of localised problems. So if you've got, so for example, lots of bikes or lots of walkers going over a certain area, you can get um, compaction of the peat or you can get um, sort of runnels forming in it, which are then further eroded by water. So these things can all cause um, damage to peatlands. Um, and the result in things like peat hags, which is kind of what we've got here, where you've got exposed faces of peat, um, you can get gullies, um, particularly along drainage lines, where um, they're eroding the peat as well, taking it downstream. Um, and as I said, lots of peat forming habitat. So even though the peat's still there, that is not the habitat that's on top of it is not forming any more peat. So it's, it's not um, kind of doing its job. Um, and obviously, you're losing a lot of carbon. So it's actually emitting carbon rather than sequestering it. Um, Sometimes you get issues such as peat slides, um, so you can kind of make out there, that there's, um, it's not very clear to see in this picture, but there's like a rocky sort of minerally base there um, where peat slid um, off the side of Mullagara a few years ago. Um, and that can sometimes be caused if the peat dries out of it, you, or if there's drainage channels into it, the water goes underneath the, the base of the peat and it can cause it to slip. And obviously it's, it can be a hazard if it's like above a road or something like that. Um, and obviously there's at least to erosion of the peat, uh, loss of carbon that's stored in the peat, and um, potentially drying out of the surrounding peat as well if it, it kind of gets exposed to, um, leaves an exposed edge to it. Um, you can also get these um, quite scary looking things called peat bites. Apologies, it's not a very good picture, but um, so they, they do happen naturally within peat, but they can be made worse um, if it's dried out because you get cracks in the peat again and the water can find its way through and it carves out a little pipe underground. Um, sometimes you can see them like this and the water is just pouring into them. Um, sometimes you wouldn't know they were there or they might, um, the ground above them might collapse a bit and you can kind of you see them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still eroding that peat, taking it um, away from underground and into the rivers. Um, like I say, they can collapse and um, yeah, cause further drying out of the peat. So, um, this, this map shows the main areas we've surveyed already for peat. Um, you can see on the, the key there that the, the deepest peat, which is over, um, over a metre, is the darkest colour there. So there are, we have got some fairly significant areas of deep peat. Um, lots of peat between 40 and 100 centimetres. Um, and then also vast areas of shallow peat, which is um, still important, still a good carbon store, um, but it's maybe not the, the priority area for any restoration work, but the, the deeper peat certainly is. Um, so, um, in order to kind of look at restoration, we first need to survey the condition of the peat. So, um, the things we're looking at are what are the erosion features, so are the peat hags, are the gullies, um, you know, any other localised erosion that we need to map. Um, 
also look at what the habitat condition is. So it could be that the habitat is still pretty good bog, or maybe just needs a, you know, a small improvement, or it could be completely degraded, um, and it could be something completely different, like acid grassland on top of deep peat, which you know would be harder to restore, but you know still important to do. Um, and we also measure the depth of peat on a more regular basis, so we kind of do 50 minute, 50, 50 meter grade rather than 150 meters, just so we have a, a better understanding of what's there. And um, you can kind of see on this, um, one of this data collection um, app here we've got there, we, um, we worked on that with um, government technology services to develop our own app for um, surveying the condition of the peat. Um, so the way we work it is I would look at aerial photographs and um, so you can quite often see gullies and hags on the aerial photographs. So we'd map them in the office, take it out and the, they, they magically appear on the device <laughs> and then you can click on the, the map feature and fill in lots of detail about it like how, how deep is the peat there, what's the, min, what's the base of the gully for example. Um, and that's important because it informs what type of restoration work you can do. So the more detail we get, the better. Um, and then we can draw our restoration plans. Um, so that's the actual kind of erosion features. We also do mapping of the habitat condition. We don't quite do it this way, but this was the students that came over and they were, they were looking at um, habitat surveys, of, of species surveys on the bog. But um, for our habitat condition assessment, we use two meter by two meter um, quadrats and put uh, what positive indicator species there are um, amongst other things, negative indicator species, species diversity, um, any erosion features that are nearby and things like that. Um, and then we kind of come up with a map that looks something like that. Um, and although it's just like it looks like a picture with lots of stuff on it, um, you could click on say the so you click on this red gully and you find out lots of information about it and photos as well. So you can kind of use that in your restoration planning. Um, in terms of restoration work, we did a few trials, some of which were successful and some not. So <laughs> the next slide is, um, we thought it might be a nice idea to have a go at seeing whether you could restore very small peat hags by hand because we had lots of volunteers and corporates interested in helping out with peatland restorations and thought, well, what can we do practically with them. So we thought, we'll see if this works, and it really doesn't. <laughs> it's really hard work, and yeah, it, it's, it's not practical. So we, have, we do have another method for reprofiling peat hags. Um, so um, this is a site in um, the Yorkshire Dales, actually. So um, a lot of their um, sites over there, they have vast areas of bare peat um, that's obviously eroding away. Um, and they can stabilize areas of peat using these coil logs. Um, so they slow any flow of water that's going off to prevent it washing the sediment away um, this, and they trap the sediment behind it and it also it creates sort of a more sheltered environment for plants to be able to become established um, and they quite often will plant it with um, cotton grass plugs because they stabilise the, the peat and allow other species to, to recolonise as well. Um, it's another one. You can kind of see on the right hand side of the slide the, the peat, sort of fine peat sediment that's been trapped there. Um, we haven't used coil logs yet, we are in the process of about to trial them, but um, so far we've, we've had a little trial with heather bales and some alternative, and they work pretty well as well. So we'll probably move forward using a mixture of the two. Um, for, if there's a larger flow of water, you can um, build leaky dams like this. And again, they're trapping sediment, letting a little bit of water through, but not huge amounts. Um, it's just kind of slowing everything down, letting the vegetation um, recolonise and hopefully reduce the erosion. Um, if you've mapped a gully and it's mineral based rather than peat on the base, um, leaky dams like the previous slide don't really work very well, so you are best to use stone because the leaky dams will, the water will just erode onto them if there's not a good depth of peat to push them into. So um, we haven't used stone yet, but it's something we're considering on some sites. Um, we did have a trial, I think that was earlier this year. We had, after after a trial restoration site, we still had some areas of bare peat um, that were just going to be eroding away. So um, we covered them in heather brush, which is just kind of heather that's been cut. We scattered it all over the place. Um, and that was to create a little sheltered environment. Um, and then we planted sphagnum moss. Um, so, um, and then you can cover it all with coil netting. 
um, to hold it all in place. So the idea is the heather brush provides a nice little sheltered environment and it hopefully won't get washed away. And they are still there, so they've been there a little while. I don't think it's probably a year now actually, I think about it. Um, this is just looking at the restoration site with some students. Um, it's on the side of Lake Pot um, and it's, it's looking pretty good a couple of years after restoration work. Um, I have got a little um, video next that shows the restoration work there in progress. It's very fast. <laughs> um, so the way it works, I'll play it in a minute if I can. Um, can okay. um, so the way it looks a bit messy and it looks like really destructive having a digger on there. But the idea is the digger will push back the turf, which is like the vegetation layer. Flat, sort of smooth out the, the peat so it's at a, a less of an angle and then recover it with vegetation so that the vegetation can then re-establish and it's not hopefully going to erode away. Sometimes you need a bit of additional like netting and heather brush on top but um, I'll play it and you can see how it works. Oh, maybe not. Uh, oh, there we go. So this is what we were trying to do by hand, but obviously <laughs> this is a lot quicker and <laughs> probably less messy in the long run. Um, I've got another one. Amazing how it kind of quite neat they can be with the dick yeah. <laughs> like that. And it does look messy immediately after, but it, it soon seems to repair itself. So it's have to have um, so just to finish off, um, just to kind of summarise the benefits of restoration work really. Um, so obviously there's habitat benefits. Um, so you improve the habitat and um, make it um, you know restore peat forming habitat is the ideal. Um, and it improves it for specialist species um, such as the sundews, um, yeah, and sphagnum mosses, which are my favourite. <laughs> um, and it improves. It, 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 it means we can um, hopefully it will have informed sustainable land use. So um, the, the the kind of like setting grazing levels and things like that that are beneficial to maintaining the habitat in good condition. Um, We've got um, carbon benefits as well, so in good condition, um, blanket bog habitat um, sequesters carbon and is a, you know, has a net cooling effect on the climate. Um, obviously in bad condition it's emitting, and a lot of peatlands in the UK and the world are emitting carbon, um, just because they've dried out a lot in poor condition. Um, so we're going to reduce emissions if we can restore peatland, um, and also it's just it's protecting that carbon store because there's a vast amount of carbon stored in peat and um, we need to look after it. Um, and the ecosystem services, so the other things that um, peatlands have a benefit for is improving water quality. So um, good blanket bog habitat, really lots of sphagnum hummocks and lots of nice vegetation. It filters the water so you get cleaner water entering the streams and reservoirs. Um, also increased resilience to wildfire. Um, wildfire is a real threat to peatland because it's full of carbon and it can burn if it gets dry and it gets catches fire, so it's a real threat. So um, by re-wetting the peat and um, reducing the risk of wildfire. Um, and also it can reduce downslope flooding, so the, the nice hummocks of sphagnum and other vegetation make the ground really rough compared to just a grassland. Um, and that kind of reduces the rate at which the water flows off into the stream and rivers. sheep had actually gotten stuck in. Oh, like the peak pipe type Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Um, good question. Um, you can, oh, we can put my email address up, really. <laughs> yeah, we'll maybe promote that as something that people can report if they see it. 
see stuff like that. Um, I have had um, volunteer um, training sessions where volunteers, if they want to go out and measure the depth of the peat, and where there's any stagnant present, they can um, they can come and do a bit of training and, and have access to the app and then go and measure the depth of the peat because we're, we're ongoing with that project. So yeah. Um, is there any kind of preferable season to do peatland restoration? Because I'm imagining if you do it at the start of summer, you've got more chance of things establishing. Or? You do, but um, we have to be careful of the bird nesting season. Okay. So most of restoration work t takes place between sort of September and March. Um, so we do it basically. It's a winter thing. <laughs> so up in the hills in the winter. Um, yeah, we, we don't really do it in the summer unless it, I guess if it was a really small area that we knew it wasn't going to be affected. Um, affecting nesting birds, then uh, we might do some, but certainly with diggers, we would, we would do it outside of the bird nesting season. You, how old do you, do you know the peat is? I mean, it, it's a good question, and Philip has probably like <laughs> done lots of studies on the, the peat here. Um, Jen, I mean, you, you can date it with carbon dating books that involves using a lab, but the, the, they think. At the, an estimated amount is if it's in good condition habitat, it will form about a millimetre a year, but that's only if it's in good condition, and I imagine that's very variable. But you can date it using, um, yeah. I'm wondering how, how the whole cycle works, and how, how, particularly about mm. you know, getting shallow peat areas deeper. Yes, work, you know? yes, yeah. Um, I mean, peat will form in lots of different habitats, not just blanket bog, but um, and, and, and so some of the shallow peat habitats that might not have ever been blanket bog, they might have formed from just really cool wet conditions. Um, so we wouldn't be able to restore everything back to blanket bog. But yeah, that's the ideal sort of nice peat forming habitats. Um, yeah, the climate's different now than it was when some of them were forming, but yeah. I want to ask a really dull question. <laughs> that's my inspiration. Um, but it's it's concerning me right now. Is that you, you both spoke about sort of corporate sponsorship and corporate money coming into your project. How do you manage that? Given that there are those sort of guaranteed success stories in conservation, work, you, know, you don't always know where it's going to go. And how you know watch those companies that's like that coming in terms of reporting and that kind of thing. Um, I think you can go first. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's about managing expectations, yes. In an ideal world, um, at least from the seagrass perspective, like corporates would love us to be able to offer carbon credits, you know, mm -hmm. for, for offsetting and we're, we're nowhere near that and it is very much a case of having that open dialogue with them and explaining that, you know, we're not there yet. From a marine perspective, we're a long way off mm -hmm. being there. Mm -hmm. um, but that their support helps us get that, that step nearer and, and, and I think it's about managing expectations and they're generally very supportive obviously and, and positive to help in, enable just that moving forward. Yeah. I think we've, we've had discussions as well with corporates that they, they want to get practically involved as well whether it's survey work or I mean you know just tidying up after the diggers have been in that kind of um, work so they're keen as a staff engagement thing and they want to raise, we've had a couple of corporates raise um, some small amounts of money, but that can be contributed. And I think it just, it's like Laura's saying, we're not going down the carbon credits route, yeah. but we're, it's something they do that they, that for their ESG requirements or what they want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, presumably, if you're a gambling uh, company or whatever, you know you've just lost as well as wins. So, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>